Hello, friends, and welcome back to another reading from the Victorian Periodical Parade. I, Owen Curtis, am going to be narrating another of Catherine Lord's short stories. Here, we have The West Room, an unresolved mystery, published in the Canterbury Journal, October 25th, 1895. Welcome back after a short hiatus over Christmas break to January 2022. I hope you've been enjoying the episode so far. It seems like we keep getting new listeners all the time, and that's awesome. Go ahead and email us at victorianperiodicalparade at gmail.com, victorianperiodicalparade on Instagram, and uh, victorianparade on Twitter. Get in touch and let us know what you think. Thanks. So we're going to jump right in. We cannot select our own time for enduring attacks of the gout. I should have thought it particularly inconsiderate of Frank's old uncle to have chosen the period he did for being seized with what he calls a visit from my old enemy, and my husband to travel the remote wilds of Scotland in order to receive what may be my last words. We had just looked forward to such a happy time of rest and quiet after our wanderings abroad, and in present circumstances Frank was particularly unwilling to leave me alone. We had been married just seven years, seven years of such happiness as falls to the lot of but few wedded folk, I think, and the three children, at least, had thriven during their wandering life with their father's arraignment. But I had had quite enough of foreign service, and greatly rejoiced at Frank's appointment to a depot in a western English county where we had secured a charming old house within an easy drive of the town, with a garden which charmed the hearts of the children. Just, however, as we had settled into our new home, came an urgent letter from old Sir John, or rather, from his doctor. The Scottish estate was entailed, and Sir John, a very grave and dignified old gentleman, was all is fond of expatiating upon the responsibilities which will hereafter devolve upon Francis, my direct heir, and his son John, my great nephew. Somehow I never recognised old Frank and little Jack under these imposing titles. Whenever Sir John had had an extra bad fit of the gout, he always, if Frank chanced to be in England, expected him to rush off to Scotland to receive his farewells and testamentary instructions. And when my husband once reached Inverloch, it was difficult for him to escape again. Still, the old man had always been very kind to us after his fashion, and was solitary and ill so I could not oppose my husband's departure, so I believed his uncle's last attack would pass off as many others had done, and his alarm for his life proved unfounded. I don't like leaving you, little woman, said my husband. If the poor old fellow really is as bad as they say, it seems cruel to refuse to go to him. I'll tell you what, I shall write and ask Roder to stay here while I'm away. I can't leave you with only servants. Oh, I said rather doubtfully. Truth to tell, I was not a little afraid of Rhoda, my husband's half-sister, whom I looked upon as one of those admirable personages destined to go through life rather respected than beloved. I knew Frank was greatly attached to her. His own mother had died in giving him birth, and his father had remarried within a year or two. Rhoda's mother, contrary to the established tradition, had proved the most kind and devoted step-parent and Frank had always regarded the baby girl, born a few years later than himself, his actual sister. The two had grown up together as inseparable companions, no other children arriving in the family. We had been so much abroad throughout our married life that I had seen very little of any of my husband's relatives, but I knew Frank's marriage had not been exactly a source of satisfaction to any of them. His father was dead, when our wedding took place, and Sir John expressed no opinion upon the matter. But I was successfully aware that most of Frank's kindred considered that Captain Seppin, young and handsome, and with Scottish estates in prospect, might have done better than marry the penniless orphan of a country vicar. I have a very vivid recollection of a three days' visit to Frank's stepmother shortly after our marriage. 
during which, though I was treated with the most punctilious kindness and courtesy, I felt that both Miss Sutton and her daughter were weighing me in the balances and finding me wanting. Of Rhoda, a keen-eyed, dark-haired, clever woman of twenty-five, I felt especially awe, and his conversation revealed my deficiencies, my ignorance of many ologies which Rhoda had at her fingers' ends, my apathy regarding the burning questions of the day, and in which my sister-in-law was so deeply interested. I felt myself but a silly child. For all my twenty years and newly acquired matronly dignity, I suspected that I was a disappointment to Frank's relatives and Rhoda, though she received me kindly for my husband's sake, was too candid by nature to be able entirely to hide this feeling. Though we had always corresponded in orthodox relatively fashion, I had never seen my stepsister since that time, and the prospect of having to entertain this, to me, rather formidable connection without Frank at hand to support me, was not cheering. You'll find out what a brick Rhoda is when you come to know her better, said my husband. I know she is rather stiff at first. She is, I said fervently. But she is the kindest and best-hearted girl in the world, went on Frank, and I murmured the acquiescence so often paid to the dictum that the repellent manner covers the best heart in the world. But the children, I said doubtfully. Oh, they'll get on all right. Rhoda adores children. Look here, little woman. I can't go away and leave you with what is about to happen so soon without some responsible person to look after you and the babies. Now, if Rhoda is here, I shall know everything is going on well, and that Jack won't be left to fall into the pond or me to tumble out the window if you should be laid up while I am away. You won't mind having a Rhoda here, will you? Darling, to ease my mind. Of course I consented. And when another imperative telegram called Frank away to Scotland, and that very afternoon, I was not, after all, sorry that my sister-in-law was to arrive the next day. For, formidable as I felt it to be, it was but a dreary thing to be let alone in the house with the servants, and the new baby's arrival expected every day. Rhoda, at thirty-two, was but little altered from my memories of her seven years ago. The same rather abrupt manner keen glances and decisive speeches, but she surprised me when children were introduced. Are those the babies? Oh, you darlings, she cried, opening her arms with an entirely new expression upon her face, and one of my fears, that the children would be afraid of her, was set at rest forever. Indeed, it required but a day or two to make Rhoda the idol of the nursery, the children being utterly unawed by her talents, her girton degree, her keen dark eyes, I actually once, on entering the nursery unexpectedly, found its lawful guardian absent, and my grave sister-in-law seated on the ground with all her hair loose, while Jack mimicked the regimental barber, to the scream and delight of his two sisters. Rhoda, laughing as loudly as the children, she sprang up when I entered, and seemed half vexed at being thus detected. My awe of her was considerably diminished from that day, and when Jack confidently informed me that Auntie Rowdy was the jolliest auntie in the world, she could tell better stories than old Flynn, I knew his heart at least was won, for old Flynn, a disreputable soldier servant, whose many delinquencies we had long winked at for the sake of his devotion to the children, was Jack's idol of human excellence. To myself, Rhoda was extremely kind and attentive, Perhaps considering the children reflected some credit upon me, and I could truthfully write and tell Frank that I was very glad to have her with me in the circumstances. For Sir John was very ill, and though the doctor was hopeful of his recovery, the old man himself piteously entreated Frank to remain with him, and it seemed cruel to refuse. Did you choose your own rooms when you came into the house, Ellen? said my sister-in-law one day. No. We've taken the house furnished, and we occupied the same bedroom as the last tenants did. Why, do you ask? Because I've been thinking that, when baby comes, you'll be far more comfortable in that large bedroom at the end of the passage than where you are now, opposite the nursery, where every little noise must disturb you. I never thought about that. I always like to be near the children, I said. Let me occupy your present room, urged Rhoda. Really, Ellen, you'll be better off. The children will be obliged to keep unnaturally quiet. I hate keeping quiet, remarked Jack. 
sotto voce, to which May responded with all an older sister's dignity. You never do. I wish you would look at the waste room, went on the rudder. It is really the largest and the pleasantest bedroom in the house. It is odd that the other tenants did not use it, but perhaps, like yourself, they wished to be near the nursery. I yielded to Rodder's importunities, inspected the room, and was certainly struck with the size and commodiousness of the disused apartment. With its convenient and spacious dressing room open and out of it, the house was one of those old-fashioned mansions to which successive architects have added rooms in all manner of unexpected corners. It was far larger than its present owners required. They had left several of the apartments unfinished, which afforded the children some delightful playgrounds on wet days. This disused bedroom, the West Room, as it was designated on the label below the bell, was the largest in the house but it had apparently been little occupied, though it was well furnished, in the somewhat cumbrous style of several generations back. It was, in a way, cut off from the rest of the house, this apartment, and the small turret room above it, approached by the winding staircase being built out at the end of a passage, and shut off from the other rooms by a stout oaken door. A spacious dressing room opened out of the bedroom, and these two apartments in the little chamber above had apparently been added to the original house by a kind of afterthought on the part of some architect. When you and your nurse want to be quiet, how convenient this outer door will be, remarked Rhoda. And I agreed to have the room cleaned, aired, and made ready for my time of trial. Certainly when I first took possession of the waste room one autumn evening, I could not help thinking that my sister-in-law had been wise in her suggestion. I was feeling very nervous and depressed, and sometimes even the voices of the romping barneys across the way were a trial. Now I could sleep undisturbed and without interfering with the children's play, and I had overheard some of the whisper planned between Jack and May for an invasion of Aunt Roddy's room at daybreak, and of the expected delights of a bolster match with that lady. And you're better here, and they're better without you, ma'am, said my nurse, a pleasant, kind lady. For in the other room, you'd be fidgeting every time Master Jack tumbled down. And however could I get the blessed new baby to sleep with those other little dearies always about the door? Yes, this exchange of rooms had been wise, no doubt. And I drew up my chair by the fire, which was pleasant on the October evening. And, dismissing my attendant, sat lingering a while, baking in its genial glow before retiring to bed. Suddenly... A feeling which I can hardly define seized upon me. A choking sensation of horror, of dread, as though I were beholding some crime which I was powerless to prevent. It is impossible to put the experience into words, but with a convulsive shudder, I sprang from my seat and rushed to the opposite end of the room as though to escape from... Nothing. The cheerful firelight flickered and fell, shewing the eminently commonplace and comfortable interior, as unlike the typical haunted room of tradition as could well be imagined. And there was neither sight nor sound nor movement in the apartment. And yet, in some way, I felt an irresistible disinclination to return to my comfortable seat by the fire. I know not why it should be so, but most people appear to consider bed as a sanctuary from supernatural annoyances. He drew the bedclothes over his head, is the orthodox description of the conduct of a beholder of a night apparition. Though I had neither seen nor heard aught that could be described as ghostly, I lost no time in shrouding myself in the sheets and was speedily asleep, in spite of my previous tremors. The bright morning sunshine and the day's cares and occupations soon effaced the previous evening's disagreeable impression from my mind. Later in the day, not feeling as well as usual, I yielded to my nurse's advice to remain in my room and partake of an invalid meal by my own fireside instead of joining the Rodda at our seven o'clock dinner. I was sitting, resting quietly after my repast, wondering if Frank would be detained much longer in Scotland, and shedding a few tears as I thought of his absence just now, when again... There came upon me the same shuddering horror, the same sick sensation of nameless terror, and again I started up as one who flees from the spectacle of some crime. 
this time, however, I succeeded in controlling myself. I am out of sorts and nervous, I said to myself, with resolute rebuke of my own folly, and I took up an engrossing novel, which I had laid down a short time before, determined to banish my fancies by its perusal. Suddenly, in the empty apartment overhead, came the sound of trample and footsteps moving rapidly and heavily about over the floor. I must tell Nurse Harris to keep that door locked, I thought to myself, for now the children have once found their way there, they will be disturbing us constantly. Heavily, very heavily, for the footsteps of little ones did trampling steps fall above. Then came the sound of a fall. I sprang up, in doing so I twisted my foot, and for a moment could me move. As the mother of three healthy, riotous children, I was pretty well accustomed to the sound of falls in the nursery, and as no company and the roar was heard, I felt tolerably satisfied that no great harm had ensued from the tumble overhead. Jack was a philosophical little soul in such accidents, which befell him incessantly, and usually picked himself up, robbed his bruises in the remark, Tumble down, tumble up, no bones broke. But now the door overhead was cautiously opened, and a dragon, bumping sound as if something heavy being dragged down the stairs was heard. Then another fall just outside my door. Children, what are you doing? I cried, trying to open it, now really alarmed. No light outside, no children. All still is the grave. Come down. Why are you hiding? Is anyone hurt? I cried impatiently, and receiving no reply, I dashed up the staircase. The room door was locked on the outside, the key in the locks. I hastily turned it, opened the door. Within was an empty, dusty apartment, dimly lighted by the moonbeams. I do not knew how I regained my own bedchamber. I must, in some manner, have thought her back there, for the next thing I recollect was finding myself on the bed with Rhoda and the nurse in anxious attendance, and the former saying, The heat of the fire must have made me faint. I felt too ill and weak to talk much then, but through the wakeful hours of that weary night, during which my careful nurse never left me, I came to one fixed resolve. Never could I occupy that dreadful apartment another evening. Never should my baby open its innocent eyes in such a terrible locale that some unknown, undetected crime had assuredly taken place. In this part of the house, I felt firmly convinced. Anyway, I was resolved to shift my quarters as early as possible. I dreaded Rodder's opposition, but the greater fear cast out the lesser. As I had expected, my decision was energetically, my decision was energetically combated by my sister-in-law. She pointed out in words of wisdom and reason, how utterly absurd it was to yield to such fancies. How he had fallen into a half faint from the heat of the fire, and in this condition had a kind of nightmare experience. How I should bring myself into a yet worse state of nerves by weakly yielding to the imaginary terrors, and might shift my room every day in obedience to some fresh fancy. Even the nurse, impressed by the commodiousness of the apartment I wished to forsake, joined in the Rodder's remonstrances, pointing out the advantages of the room for a sick chamber and volubly assuring me ladies so often have dreams and fancies at these times. She had nursed a lady, etc. I will go to the workhouse infirmary rather than remain here, I cried at length with a passionate flood of tears, reckless now, for I felt I had lost the last shred of Rhoda's esteem and would be forever in her eyes a foolish, whimsical, altogether irrational creature. Of course, if you are going to excite yourself in this manner, Ellen, there is no more to be said about the matter, was Rhoda's rather cold reply. So I carried my point and was transferred to my old apartment. Rudder, assisting in the work of removal with silent but very palpable displeasure, Nurse Harris less reticent and openly muttering about ladies who gave themselves up to fancies. An unexpected ally, however, came to me aid when the old doctor looked in to see how I was going on, which he now did every few days. He found us busied in transferring my belongings from one room to the other, and Rhoda and Nurse Harris explained in rather injured tones that I had taken a sudden dislike to the West Room and would move out of it. The West Room, 
Do you mean that shut off one at the end of the passage? I thought that was never used now, said Dr. Willis rather sharply. You know something about that room, I said, for his tune was peculiar. My sister-in-law was delighted with the room at first, said Rodder, but she had a bad dream there one night and took a fancy. Dr. Willis, I am sure you know of some story about that room, I persisted, watching his face narrowly. My dear young lady, he said lightly, I am sorry I cannot supply you with a proper ghost story, but I am afraid the house is neither old nor aristocratic enough to boast of family spectre. You must take some baronial hall or historic mansion if you want that sort of thing. But I think you are quite as well out of that west room. Apartments which have not been regularly occupied are apt to be damp. You have some other reason for saying I'm better out of it, I persisted. But Dr. Willis apparently did not hear me, for he began to talk about the common local exhibition of autumn flowers and to ask if we intended entering as competitors. The chrysanthemums in our garden have a great reputation in our neighbourhood. My own little autumn blossom arrived that night, that fair sweet flower which was so soon to be planted in the garden above. The babe lingered with us for but a day, and for many weary weeks afterwards, it was thought that I was to follow my little one to the silent land. Gradually, very gradually, it crept back to life. Thanks greatly to the devotion of my sister-in-law. Real natures come out in times of sickness and sorrow. In my invalid chamber, I learnt to know Rodder as I had never done before. I do not think any cloud or doubt or misunderstanding will ever come between us again. In my sad time of sickness and sorrow, one for me a devoted and affectionate sister, who, as the children say, is to live in our house till we are all hundreds of years old. Poor old Sir John had died rather suddenly at last, and Frank, hastening home at once, unwilling to startle me by telegram, arrived to find a little daughter, newly born, a wife, apparently dying. It was the younger, not the older life, which the reaper death gathered at last, and Rhoda, unselfish, devoted Rhoda, who was the stay and support of us all throughout that terrible time, had the joy of seeing her toil in the sick room repaid in my complete recovery. As soon as I was able to travel, we went to take possession of the Scottish estate, where we have resided ever since, and two little ones have come to fill the place of the short-lived babe who was born in the house in Shire. My long illness and the sorrow of our loss, the death of only a babe, means a very real grief to its parents. But the memory of the strange sensations I had experienced in that waste room almost out of my head, and Frank and Rodder never encouraged me to talk about the matter. But some ten years afterwards, at the big gooseberry time of year, I saw a paragraph in a paper. Strange discovery in a house in Shire. The house, no other than the one we had formerly occupied. It seemed that the persons from whom we had rented it had been compelled, like many other country folk nowadays, to sell the home which had been in the possession of their family since its erection many generations ago. The new purchaser was making extensive alterations and improvements, in the course of which the hard stone of the west room was removed. And there, just where I had sat when that nameless horror had seized me, was discovered the skeleton of a woman. Local tradition was now revived, and it was remembered that towards the close of the last century, the house was occupied by a squire of somewhat dubious character, son of the original builders of the mansion. This person, during the lifetime of his parents, led a wandering and dissolute life on the continent, and when he returned to take possession of his property, was accompanied by a French lady to whom scandal asserted he was not allied by the ties of Whitlock. The two led a disreputable existence together, shunned by the neighbours. A foreign servant, who was on the most confident terms with his master, had come with the lady, and the rooms at the end of the passage were devoted to the latter's accommodation. The turret apartment serving as his boudoir, 
darker rumours then, even accusations of immorality, were beginning to circulate in the neighbourhood, with spurs that the squire was supplying traitorous information to France, with which country England was then at war. It was but a rumour, a whisper, and the squire now began to pay visits to London, where it was said he was courting a young lady whose relatives were presumably ignorant of the circumstances of his domestic arrangements in the country. But prying servants asserted that the attraction which drew their master to London was detected by the French damsel, and that, on his return from town on one occasion, an awful scene occurred between the pair. The foreign lady, who spoke English fluently, frequently exclaiming loud enough to be heard through the locked door that she knew what would hang him and would be amply revenged. Next day the lady was not seen, nor indeed was she ever again but ill. Mr. Baptiste, the French valet, announced she had left the house in a rage early in the morning after the quarrel overheard by the domestics, and that neither he nor his master knew where she had gone, but they supposed she had returned to France. No one in the neighbourhood was concerned to inquire into the fate of a shameless and friendless foreigner of more than questionable character. Mr. Baptiste locked up her deserted rooms. The squire paid a longer visit than usual to London and returned after some months with a fair young wife and settled down in his house as a reformed and visitable character. Good fortune, however, did not attend him. He broke his neck in the hunting field within a year of his marriage and the shock of his sudden death proved fatal for his young wife and their expected heir. The house passed to distant cousins from whose descendants we rented it. No definite ghost story had ever been connected with the West Room, but possibly from its associations with its first occupant, it had been out of favour with the squire's descendants, and it was sometimes whispered that disagreeable dreams, if nothing else, visited the occupant of that chamber. As a very old resident in the neighbourhood, the local doctor, of course, knew of such traditions. Had the murder actually been committed in these apartments? Had, as I believe, the miserable woman been slain to silence her tongue, surprised in her turret room by the valet, or his master, or both murdered? and then hidden beneath the hearthstone of her bedchamber. Who can answer these questions now both victim and murderers have alike passed away? The newspaper spoke of the discovery of the skeleton as revealing an unsolved mystery, but I shall always fancy that I know something of the facts of the case. Possibly some persons are more susceptible to uncanny influences than others. Possibly my then nervous and highly wrought condition made me something of a medium at that time. But I shall always believe that the story of the crime committed in those apartments was revealed to me during my brief occupancy of the West Room. Notes. Note 1. Possibly from Dickens' The Pickwick Papers, but used here in the wrong context. He drew the bedclothes over his head, is the orthodox description of the conduct of a beholder of a night apparition. Thanks again for tuning in to the Victorian Periodical Parade. This is Season 3, Episode 5, Part 1. Please tune in to Part 2 of Episode 5 of Season 3 as Kari Nixon breaks down the meaning of this story and what she can gather about all of its important details coming soon. We're back on the monthly installments of the short stories of Catherine Lord. These have been edited down by Johnny Mains. So on whatever podcatcher you're currently using, make sure you hit that notification button that lets you know when our newest episode comes out. Check out Instagram for all of our posts and related content there. Have a great day. See ya.